the live stream is ready. Hello, everyone. I invite the panelists to turn on their videos at this time. Welcome all to the launch and panel discussion on the Peace Science Digest special issue on local, national, and international peace building in col collaboration with Peace Direct. I'd also like to give a special acknowledgement to our co-sponsor for today's event, the Better Evidence Project at George Mason University's Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution. My name is Kelsey Coolidge, and I'm the Associate Director of the War Prevention Initiative and the Managing Editor of the Peace Science Digest. The War Prevention Initiative seeks to transform the global peace and security paradigm to one that is built around viable alternatives to war and all forms of political violence. To achieve this, we research, advocate for, and advance knowledge and practices that demonstrate the effectiveness of nonviolence and challenge militarism. This is why we produce the Peace Science Digest, an online publication that increases the visibility and application of peace science by producing a new analysis every two weeks that summarizes and reflects on new research. We also produce two special issues every year that focus on a single thematic subject. In the past year, the Digest editorial team noticed an increasing number of new academic work on local peace building. We already knew from our friends and colleagues at Peace Direct that local peace building can be a powerful force for change by centering local expertise and solutions, creating space for marginalized voices to lead, and shifting resources, whether economic or otherwise, to local agents of constructive change. In short, local ownership makes peace stick. Yet this recent embrace of local peace building comes with a new set of challenges and considerations, namely in the interactions between local, national, and international scales of peace building. We turn to the academic literature featured in this special issue to help us further unpack these complex relationships. This emphasis on local solutions and local knowledge means that we have to acknowledge ongoing citizen-led movements for social justice taking place in the United States and around the world. It is urgent and necessary that we apply the lessons from local peace building to our current context, even in places that might fall below the threshold of what we might consider widespread violence or war. Namely, we can work to elevate non-dominant or marginalized voices to support solutions that create a more equitable and peaceful society. But as much as these lessons from local peace building may be increasingly recognized as the pathway forward, we cannot escape the broader context of militarization within which local peace building takes place. Rather than bring security, militarized approaches to conflict, create direct harm and pull resources from schools, health and trauma care, vocational training, housing, food security, sustainable energy, reconciliation work, arts and culture, and more, all of which would actually make individuals and communities more secure, more vibrant, and more resilient. With all of this in mind, I have just a few housekeeping items to share before we get started with our panel. For those of you who are joining us over Zoom, we encourage you to submit your questions via the chat box below. We'll be monitoring this during the panel discussion and we'll share your questions with the panelists during the Q&A. For those of you who are joining us over YouTube, please comment and ask questions in the comments section. We'll also be monitoring and sharing questions from YouTube with the panelists during the Q&A. Finally, I encourage you all to follow along on Twitter through the hashtag peaceislocal and via our Twitter account at PeaceSciDigest and at Peace Direct. I'll include links to those accounts in the chat box. I'm happy to introduce our facilitator, Dr. Christina Hook. Dr. Christina Hook is the Executive Director of the Better Evidence Project at George Mason University's Carter School. She is an anthropologist and scholar practitioner specializing in large-scale violence against civilians, as well as emerging forms of warfare and violence. Dr. Hook received a joint PhD in Anthropology and Peace Studies from the University of Notre Dame's Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies and Anthropology Department. A 2018-2019 Fulbright Scholar to Ukraine, she recently, recently conducted two and a half years of ethnographic fieldwork in this context. 
She has worked in 23 countries around the world on violence prevention and humanitarian projects. Prior to her time in academia, she served as a policy advisor at the US Department of State and in leadership roles with several international NGOs that promoted locally led peace building. She has already provided such useful insight to me about the special issue in our brief time working together, and I'm sure she'll convey the same brilliance during our discussion today. Without further ado, Dr. Christina Hook. Thank you so much, Kelsey. I can't tell you how excited we are at the Better Evidence Project to join our colleagues at this event and to highlight the work that's been done by the War Prevention Initiative and by Peace Direct. For those of you who are joining our event without having yet read the special issue, you are in for a real treat. And I think that you're also in for a real treat with the next hour and a half because we've gathered four truly distinguished experts who also represent very different professional points of view. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our four distinguished experts, beginning with Bina Lakshmi Nepram. She is an indigenous scholar and a human rights defender whose work focuses on deepening democracy and championing women-led peace, security, and disarmament. She is the founder of three organizations, the Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network, the Control Arms Foundation of India, and the Global Alliance of Indigenous Peoples, Gender Justice and Peace. She has authored and edited five books, including Deepening Democracy, Diversity and Women's Rights in India, Where Are the Women in Our Decision Making, and South Asia's Fractured Frontier. Her work has garnered international recognition, including the Anna Politkovskaya Award, the Women Have Wings Award, the CNN IBN Real Heroes Award, the Ashoka Social Innovators Fellowship, and the Sean McBride Peace Prize. In 2013, the UK-based Action on Armed Violence named her one of the 100 most influential people in the world working on arms violence reduction. Ms. Nipram served as IIE SRF Visiting Scholar at Connecticut College in 2018 to 19 and at Columbia University in 2017 to 18. She is a board member of the International Peace Bureau, which is the 1910 Nobel Peace Prize Laureate. Welcome, we're so glad you're here. We next have Severine Otosier. She is an award-winning author, peace builder, and researcher, as well as professor of political science at Barnard College, Columbia University. She is the author of several books, including The Trouble with Congo, Peace Land and Frontiers of Peace, in addition to articles for such publications as Foreign Affairs, International Organization, and New York Times. She has been involved intimately in the world of international aid for 20 years. She has conducted research in 12 different conflict zones from Colombia to Somalia to Israel and the Palestinian territories. And she has worked for Doctors Without Borders in places like Afghanistan and Congo and at the United Nations headquarters in New York. Her research has helped shape the intervention strategy of several UN departments, foreign affairs ministries, and non-governmental organizations, as well as numerous philanthropists and activists. She has also been a featured speaker at the World Summit of Nobel Peace Laureates and the US House of Representatives. Welcome. We also have joining us today, Sumei Nakaya. She has joined the United Nations after completing a PhD in political science at the City University of New York. She has since overseen the work of the African Union, UN Hybrid Mission in Darfur, and the UN Mission in South Sudan. She has specialized in crisis management, strategic mission planning, and research involving the UN Charter and the work of the Security Council. She previously worked with the Conflict Prevention and Peace Forum of the Social Science Research Council, as well as the UN Development Fund for Women. She has published on post-war state building and gendered peace dimensions of peace negotiations in edited volumes published by the UN University Press, as well as the University of Alberta Press. And she's published in academic journals, including the Central Asian Survey and Global Governance. She is taught in the Queens College, New York, and she is currently conducting research on local ceasefires. Thank you so much for joining us. And finally, we have Peter Caranto. He is the Director of the Office of African Affairs in the Department of State's Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. In this capacity, Caranto leads 25 staff supporting US diplomacy to anticipate, prevent, and respond to violent conflict across Sub-Saharan Africa. 
He also co-leads the State Department's implementation of the Global Fragility Act, developing new approaches to break the costly cycle of fragility and conflict. Prior to working at the U.S. State Department, Caranto worked to shape U.S. foreign policy towards fragile and conflict-affected states as an activist, non-governmental advocate, and congressional staffer. He worked as a foreign policy staffer at the U.S. Senate Foreign Relations Subcommittee on African Affairs and its then chairman, Senator Russ Feingold. As a Marshall Scholar, he received a master's degrees from the University of Oxford and University of Bradford. He studied as an undergraduate at the University of Notre Dame and in his personal capacity teaches a graduate course on policy approaches to violent conflict at Notre Dame's Keough School of Global Affairs. Thank you so much to each of you for joining us today. With such distinguished backgrounds joining us, I wanted to invite all of our panelists to speak on my first question. My first question to you is an invitation to tell us more about the personal journey that led you to value locally led peace building. So specifically, I'd like to ask all four of you to comment on the time in your career where the importance of supporting more locally led peace building first became important to you. What were the events, the experiences, and the insight that led you to this revelation? Well, for, for me, there was not a haha -ha moment, like a, a, a time where I really thought, oh, that's it, like now I get it. It was more gradual and I would say really steady process. Uh, I, I actually started in the late 90s when, when I started in the aid world. I was a typical aid worker and I really thought that everything was going great with the aid world and there was no problem and uh, you know everything was the way it should be. Uh, and, and then I started my doctoral work and, and work on my first book, The Trouble with the Congo. And that's really when I started to realize the importance of, of local uh, bottom-up causes of violence. Uh, and really understanding how, how much conflict and how much violence is driven by conflict at the individual, the family, the clan, the village level, a conflict of our land, of our community, of our local traditional power. And to me, that started bringing home the idea of uh, the importance of locally led peace building, because it's very rare that international elites uh, or international peace builders or even national elites have the in-depth understanding of local conditions that they need to build peace on the ground. So that was the, the first moment where I thought, huh, there is maybe something wrong with, with the way we currently build peace and provide aid. Uh, and, and then I continued my research and for my second book, I saw how peace building was so outsider driven and, and how that was the absolute antithesis of, of local, locally led peace building. Uh, and, and that's really when, when I was working on this book that I fully realized that there is a, a really widest spread and pervasive and, and, and highly problematic focus on the knowledge of outsiders. Uh, at the expense of the knowledge of insiders, of, of local people. And, uh, and I, 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 sh I show in, in Peaceland that, uh, that there are many consequences uh, um, around this preference for outside knowledge and, and for foreign expertise. Uh, it's a huge obstacle uh, to locally led peace building. And uh, it's also causing a lot of death and a lot of unnecessary suffering uh, because we uh, rely so much on foreign experts and on national elites. And, and to me, the, the research I've been conducting for the past five years, it's actually the culmination of this thought process, but it's a hopeful, uh, positive uh, culmination of this thought process. And, and it's hopefully the most useful part of my research work for policymakers and practitioners, so for most of the people who I assume are joining us today, because the book, the new book talks about the importance of locally led processes. But what's really important is that I've switched my focus from looking at failure to looking at success. Uh, looking not only at why locally led peace building is important, but how we can promote locally led peace building. What are the examples of locally led peace building around the world? What are the success stories and what, what we can all learn from it so that we can improve our own peace efforts and so that we can actually make locally led peace building a, uh, a reality on the ground. Thank you, Sumia. I'd like to ask you to comment next. Sure. 
First, um, I really want to congratulate on this uh, special issue, um, which is a very insightful, thoughtful publication, very provoking. Only if the UN was capable of asking these hard questions ourselves, um, we would be a little bit more relevant than where we are now. Um, and with that, again, I have to sort of confess that um, I'll be speaking on my, my personal capacity, not representing uh, the UN or my Department of Peace Operations, because I tend to be uh, probably a little bit too critical of my own <laughs> organization than, uh, than my bosses allow me. Um, as with Sabrina, I also started my career as an aid worker, um, you know, studying at sort of volunteering um, in my university days. Um, at the time I was in Cambodia, helping with the refugee repatriation and resettlement. And at the time, there was this large, largest UN mission at the time, UNTAC, but from the villages I was in, um, Antak was so far away, so removed. People, you know, just didn't see other than the white cars passing by from time to time. So um, I could say again, I started my professional life um, realizing that the, the low fully led peace building is not only important, but that was the only game in town um, in places that I was. But after finishing PhD, I, I joined the UN, uh, the, uh, the peacekeeping department, and it was shocking how removed we are um, from that local scene. You know, when you are um, an NGO um, personnel or independent researcher doing field work, you know, you travel with local vehicles, right? You talk to the taxi drivers who are the you know, best source of information um, about everything. But the UN um, folks, I mean, they live in fortified camps and they drive this vehicle from government building to restaurants to bars. When they party, they only party with themselves. Um, if you go to the NGO party, you never find it. You know, the UN uh, colleagues, um, they never hang out with the local national staff, let alone even the UN country peace um, partners. So that silo mentality was came as, as, a, as a huge shock, and that really made us very inward looking, only looking at our own um, spaces and, and our own plans and you know successes and um, less so failure. Um, at the moment, um, I, I, I've been working the past 10 years in this peacekeeping um, department and overseeing the deployment of missions and also planning for um, evolving scenarios like um, uh, in Syria or um, Mission Jordan in Haiti, among others. And there, I do see the limits of a conventional formula for conflict prevention. Um, so we can touch upon it, um, but how um, the conflicts are no longer confined to um, you know, remote battlefields, but brewing in you know, cities, commercial hubs, urban areas, and even in countries at different income levels. Uh, you, know, you see you know, what's happening in Mexico, Venezuela, and that is equal to you know, sort of the war, but uh, the Security Council doesn't call that way. And therefore, our interventions are limited. But that's the sort of changing nature of conflict where you have a multiple actors, multi-layered levels or locations of violence. And it's no longer bipolar. It's no longer you know, government versus opposition, but you know, different elements um, inclusive of extremist or criminal um, elements um, and how the violence is um, you know, diffused with local or individual or supranational competition, competition. Again, this is all this complex background and the UN or you know, larger the international response is so much, very much um, focused on national level interventions at the expense of local knowledge, local dynamics, and local actors. Um, before I, I con um, just conclude, and maybe just um, add one element for discussion later, I think the challenge uh, for bureaucracy like the UN is uh, not only the issue of conflict analysis. Um, in your uh, special issue, you touched upon the, you know, the, the issue of the knowledge dissemination or certain um, 
parts of knowledge are privileged and or not privileged, but um, for organizations like the UN, um, how the conflict analysis really translates into actual intervention models, the response mechanisms, is yet, yet another huge gap that we really need to tackle. I'll stop at that and back to you. Peter, I'd like to invite you to speak next. All right, Th thank you, Christina. And let me let me first say it's great to be with a fellow graduate of the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. Uh, I wanna congratulate everyone who's been involved with the Peace Science Digest uh, special issue. It is a really tremendous piece of work and, and going to be extremely valuable for all of us that work together on, on these issues. I, I'm also uh, really humbled, honored, inspired to be with this distinguished group of, of panelists. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try not to talk too much because I wanna do more, uh, more listening. Uh, as was mentioned, um, I'm, I'm speaking today in my personal capacity as well, uh, but I work at the US State Department. And I thought it might be helpful to reflect on this question from an international government uh, actor or perspective. And so I wanna start uh, by throwing out three numbers three numbers that everyone on this call should be familiar with. 35, 76 billion, and four. So 35 is the number of countries that experienced or suffered from armed conflict in 2019, according to the Peace Research Institute, Oslo. And to build on what, what Sumi was saying, that doesn't include a number of countries that are experiencing high levels of violence and homicide, but don't meet our traditional definitions. We also know many more countries are at risk. And so the international community faces a real imperative with how do we deal with the fact that more and more countries based on current trends are experiencing high levels of violence and instability. 76 billion refers to the amount of money that the international community provided to fragile countries and regions in 2018, the last year for which we have data, according to the excellent report put out by the OECD uh, just last month, their States of Fragility Report, $76 billion. That's one of the highest numbers we've seen, and that number has continued to go up and up over recent years. And yet this brings me to my last number, four. Only 4%, only an estimated 4% of that assistance, based on the, the data that's available, was focused on preventing conflict and promoting peace. And again, this comes from the great work that, that the OECD has, has done. I had the opportunity uh, a couple of years ago to lead an internal US government review of our assistance, of all the funding that we provide to try to help countries to achieve greater stability uh, and long-term developments that, that, that uh, fall within this category of fragility. And, and this review was, was driven by a, a clear sense that we're spending, that we, the international donor community, are spending a lot of money trying to achieve peace and stability. And yet, when we look at the results of those investments, it's dissatisfying. Uh, I don't think anybody feels, feels good about, about what we've achieved. And what was clear from the research that we did and the interviews that we, that we held is that more development assistance, more peacekeeping, more external intervention does not directly lead to more peace and more stability. What matters is not the quantity of these efforts. What matters is the quality of our engagement. Who are we engaging with? How are we engaging? What are we trying to accomplish? And we know that, that at the end of the day, these issues that we are talking about, issues of violence, fragility, conflict, are inherently political and they're frequently local. And so if we want to have greater results, we need to focus more on the political dimensions that are playing out at national levels but also at, at, at local levels. And we need to be more deliberate in how we engage. And so for, for me as a government actor, I think all of that leads to a conclusion that we need to get smarter about local peace building and we need to put more investment into locally led initiatives that can deliver results. I'll stop there. Yeah, I, uh, <clears throat> I think Peter is spot on when he said many of the conflicts in the world are political and but then it's um and and it's not enough that what is uh, the peace work that needs to come is not enough and i'll 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 jump in at that and he threw a couple of data 
And I'm going to throw a couple of data too. The data is, is the fact that most of the peace building, in fact, a uh, couple of things. One is for all the like money that is spent in the world on peace operations, peace work, only 2% goes to the communities. 2% goes to the affected communities. 98% is in administration. It's in the hotel bookings. It's in your, uh, you know, um, uh, what can I say? That shocked me when I discovered that only 2% of all the aid that you give to ensure that a conflict area is healed, 2% goes to the community. So this, if we have to really have local peace building meaningful, we got to turn this table. So I would like to put that. Number two, Peter also mentioned that there are 35 countries in the world which are affecting conflict, okay, affected by conflict as per the Oslo report. Let me also throw out this data that this 35 are known conflicts. There are 300 plus unreported, unknown, understood or shared conflicts in the world which we do not know. And this will bring me to my assessment of what uh, Christina asked. What is, why did people like myself did start the peace work? Um, I, am, I was born in Manipur, which is an indigenous uh, region, a former Asiatic nation state, which was, uh, you know, became part of the British Empire in 1891. And then India took us uh, you know, under duress in 1949. So we were an independent Asiatic nation state like Bhutan, Nepal. But in 1949, we became a part of the Union of India. So I have an Indian passport. I mean, this is what I carry. And because of this political conflict, uh, and again, the Manipur conflict is again, one of the 300 unreported, unknown conflicts in the world. This is what I would like to say. And the reason why I started my peace work is for me, I wanted to be a physicist in my life. I dreamt of becoming a scientist. So I loved when the Peace Science Digest, you know, published. And again, congratulations on this really important work um, that you have done in this October edition on local peace building. And for me, it was, um, you know, Manipur is an area where people love science and I wanted to be a scientist, but then as I mentioned, the way in which Manipur joined the Union of India under duress, which constitutional experts call it null and void, is because, because of this political conflict, uh, you know, violence erupted. Initially, uh, because as I mentioned, uh, India then imposed in, in parts of Manipur and northeast of India, a martial law as early as 1958, called the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. So, for me as a child growing up in Manipur, in the Northeast of India, this is a part of India which shares border with five countries. 98% of our territory is with five countries, China to the North, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Bhutan. We share only 2% with boundary with India in a area called Chicken Necks Corridor, 12 miles. So this is a place which is home to 45 million indigenous people. You will have not heard of this region because the history of 45 million people here are not in the textbooks of India. They are not in the narrative of the global narrative of understanding India. They are not in the global narrative of understanding Asia. And that is why uh, the conflict in this particular part of India where I was born and raised, for me, my personal journey started with the fact that I was born in a war zone. So imagine like for every 20 Manipuris, we have one Indian military. The area that I grew up is so militarized that after four o'clock, no one moves in, in the streets at night because only the military insurgents and the street dogs move at night. Is the, it is this kind of like violence I've seen all our lives. So for us, peace for us is not a project. For us, it became a survival, a, a way to able to see how can uh, indigenous communities in this unreported war zones of the world. We are so close to where the Rohingyas are. We are so close to where the Uyghur population are. Yet the world talks about all these other conflicts. And the conflict in India's Northeast is Asia's longest running armed conflict. It started in the 1940s and it continues till today. The reason why you don't know about this conflict is because international press is not allowed in our territories. 
And forget the press. If you come to India with an Indian visa today, once the pandemic is over, you are not allowed in several of our territories. No international humanitarian aid organization is allowed. Ford Foundation not allowed. UN organizations not allowed. It's we're just a blank space in the narrative of the world. For, that is precisely for this reason. For some of us, we do this peace work. The reason is when you're pushed to a wall, when we have 50,000 people killed in this conflict, where we have more than 300,000 military operating in this part of the world, and when there is a martial law, what do you do? Either you get depressed or you fight back. So for us, doing peace work was an was a method to fight back against the violence in our lives, in our bodies, in our communities, and in our, uh, you know, in our in, in in our states, in our nation states, in that part of the world. So that's why uh, we have done this peace work. Now, what I analyze, having done almost a decade and a half of peace work, so I stopped being a physicist, I became a researcher, and I documented the origins of violence in the Indo-Burma border. Because this is one of the world's unreported, as I said, uns, unstudied areas, which there's no proper analysis done ever, literally ever, by New Delhi or New York or even London or Geneva. So very few of our work. So we had to plunge into peace work because we realize that if you don't do, no one is going to do it. Because we know this brings my, us to my uh, final assessment of how the war methods of war and warfare are, are basically ideated, particularly in uh, metropolitan areas or areas which there are more population, okay, literally, like in capital cities, literally. Peace work has to be done because the kind of war games done is on our fields, in our rice fields, in our marketplaces, in our communities that the war is played out. And that is why it is so important for us to do the kind of work that we are doing. The other aspect of peace work that I've seen is, it's a very top down approach as your publication, October publication also share. This is true. There is such an unequal way in which uh, the, um, uh, this is done. It's a very top down approach where the main peace work you know, has been from London, Geneva, New York. And I love many of the people who work in these places. There are many genuine people, but it is time to turn the tables a bit because it cannot go on like this, as Peter said, with all the research in the world, with all the work that's being done in the world, how come the world is becoming more and more violent that currently 68 million people are displaced out of which 85% of that are in the global south where I come from. But yet politicians use this in the global north to drive away poor migrant population. But a lot of this is that this kind of politics has to stop literally. So it is very important. And what happens is the um, many, many international uh, humanitarian organizations who are working in this, as I said, I've known many of them. Some of them are really amazing people. I've worked in several campaigns, international campaign. Whatever I felt is that as the um, theme of our discussion today is, it is not really, uh, again, it's such a top-down approach that we have to invert that uh, precisely because wars and conflicts affect the marginalized. Are, and most important as an indigenous person, several indigenous areas in the world are the most militarized, weaponized zones, as I mentioned to you, my research found out that 58 type of weapons from 13 countries have flooded Manipur in Northeast of India. So America may have never heard of Manipur, but its M16s have already reached. And the Cold War weapons are flooding many part of this conflict zones. So I think it's really important that uh, to be able to have genuine peace that we all need in our lives, in our communities, in our nation. We've got to invert the table in which peace is done from a ground below, not a top, top down approach. Thank you. I want to say thanks to each of you for your candid reflections here. And I just had the thought crossing my mind that there's really no other place I'd rather be on a Friday afternoon than having this, this conversation because we're one question in. And I think that we're already getting to 
the entanglements and the roots of these very complicated issues. Just picking up on a few of the themes that I've heard you all say, um, Sumi, you talked about the siloing um, feeling of some international organizations, and I think that complements um, from the reverse angle what Bean has just talked about with these areas of conflicts that feel very much like a blank page, I think you said. And then Peter, when you give us these very striking and hard statistics to hear, it's very easy to see um, the frustration that Severine has mentioned in her opening remarks and how um, even the, the transition to focusing on successes is, is something that we have to transition to because the failures are so apparent to see sometimes. Um, I'd like to again open up my next question to each of you. Um, focusing this question on the Peace Science Digest that uh, many of you have very kindly mentioned, um, a claim is made in this digest that the larger field of peace building has in fact embraced this local turn. So do you agree? And if you do, I'd like you to comment on what you think might have precipitated this. Okay, I'm going to start again. Um, I, I would say that yes, in, in academia, certainly there, there has been uh, what we call a local term. There are a lot of articles, of papers, panels, books on the local causes of violence, on the importance of supporting local efforts, on why not supporting local efforts is problematic. And uh, the Peace Science Digest, uh, the latest issue is to me is very representative of that. It's, it's a wonderful overview of many of the ideas and the debates that uh, we have around the local term. So for academia, yes, I, I completely agree with you, Christina, that there has been a local term. Um, for the policy world or the practitioners world, I, I, I'd like to, to build on what Sumi and Peter and Bina were saying and say that uh, maybe, yes, there has been a local turn in the discourse, but not so much in practice. Uh, so in the discourse, yes, everybody says, everybody I talk to says that uh, locally peace building is locally driven peace building is important. Uh, if you read uh, United Nations reports, if you need United Nations mandates, uh, if you need uh, the uh, you know the website of many non governmental organizations, many even government organizations, uh, you really see local locally driven peace building. Uh, it, it's become a buzzword uh, so much so that uh, I feel that whenever I, I talk about the importance of that, uh, like I'm I'm saying a tourism like everybody knows that. Uh, but the thing is that as, as Sumi was saying, and as Bina was saying, and as Peter was saying, in practice, uh, everything, peace building is still very much outsider driven and elite driven. Uh, there is still a lot more money, time, and efforts that are devoted to national and international peace processes rather than to local peace building, as, as Bina was, was reminding us. And, and, and the sad thing is that the COVID pandemic has even further reinforced uh, the tendency to focus on elite because elites are much easier to, to reach when uh, you can only do things online uh, and when you only have access to remote modes of communication. Um, and for local peace building programs, I mean, sometimes, yes, they exist, but still, very often, they're still designed by outsiders, they are designed by foreigners, they're like, in the best case scenario, they're designed by foreigners in conjunction with a few national elites, but they're really designed by people who are based in uh, national capitals and headquarters, it's usually outsiders who uh, think about a project, who decide everything important about the project, and then local people, local non-governmental organizations, grassroots organizations come in, but they come in to implement the project or to sensitize the population. I, I hate that. It means like, hey, let me tell you why you, the project is important and why you like it. It's not at all <laughs> ownership or locally led peace building. Um, and, and, and again, when, uh, when international organizations try to promote local ownership, very often they tell me, oh yes, I've done that. The minister has signed on or the president is on board. So it's not local ownership, it's national ownership. 
Um, and, and again, when they tell me, oh yes, you know, I've involved local people in the design of the project. And then when I say, okay, who have you involved? Again, it goes back to, oh, I've talked with the government. I've so talked with the governor. Uh, sometimes, you know, in the best case scenario, they'll tell me, well, I've talked with the local NGOs, the chief of the village, the chief of police, the traditional chief. But usually it's a very small circle of what I call the usual suspects. Uh, people who everybody talked to, who speak the donor language, so either, you know, actual donor language, like English, like, you know, proper language, or, or the donor lingo, who, who know how to frame things in a way that, that we foreigners understand. Uh, and that can actually further marginalize other uh, ordinary citizens. And, and that's something that's very clear in the Peace Digest issue and, and in the wonderful Elena that's uh, summarized the Elena, the, uh, sorry, the wonderful article that's uh, that's summarized by uh, Yelena Bradovich Boksnik on the hidden politics of local peace building in the former Yugoslavia. So in practice, I wouldn't say that there has been a full local turn because local people and especially ordinary citizens are so very rarely involved in the design and planning of international efforts. But I don't want to be the, <laughs> the very negative people on this uh, person on this panel. So let me just finish that thought by saying that it is possible to involve ordinary people in the design and planning of international efforts. I, I know organizations could do that absolutely wonderfully. Peace Direct is, is one of them. And I know it's the co-sponsor of, of this webinar. And there are also other wonderful organizations like uh, the Resolve Network, like um, uh, the Life and Peace Institute. Uh, and, and we can really learn from all of these organizations when we think about going forward and how to actually make the local turn a reality on the ground. Sumi, I'd like to invite you to uh, just to address this question next, and I wonder if you can um, even push it farther by by figuring out how the siloing effect and this turn towards the local peace building could possibly coexist or, or begin to overlap. Sure, um, I agree with everything, literally everything that Severin said. Um, every single word of it. Maybe if we can add um, to it. I think there is an inherent and the built-in sort of assumption or connection that's in the international peace building approach, in that peace building is often equated with state building. Um, from the mediation of the peace negotiations between the government and rebel to the implementation of the agreement through the UN peacekeeping or special political mission, through the you know the disarmament and demobilization of combatants to post war elections ultimate goal um, is to form a unitary government um, through which to reconstitute a unified army and territorial control. What it means is that, as Bina was saying, um, those parts that are not under, hmm? those parts uh, that, that are not recognized um, properly by the central state or those parts um, that central state um, you know, consider as peripherally marginal and to be discarded, those, you know, places can never be part of the peace building, the state building project. And unfortunately, that model um, hasn't changed in the in the mindset of the UN decision makers, even even as you know, Peter and Bino you know, were saying, even if we begin to see that the boundary between the armed conflict and militarism and political violence, sectarian conflict, criminality, radicalism, the boundary between those different forms of violence um, has become blur. And you know, there's this very top-down state building-ish solution no longer addresses um, you know, most of these forms of conflict, but still, for some reason, um, you know, the peace and security architecture, international peace and security architecture has not really um, conflicted head on. I see a lot more local action um, and local national international linkages taking place in, in areas like climate change, for instance. There are quite dynamic conversations taking place at different layers of decision making, um, you know, um, when it comes to disaster reduction, climate change, um, you know, urban planning um, um, for reconciliation and so forth. 
but not yet in in uh, in 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 the peace and, and security area. I mean, personally, I do think that, and again, I agree with what Severin described as this UN preoccupation with national level solutions, and when UN does you know, support the local um, peace building, it's usually ad hoc reconciliation conferences, inviting the, the traditional chiefs, but excluding, um, you know, that the gangs who may actually control um, the use of force much more so than state security forces in go or that way. Um, but we never talk to these people, um, you know, and therefore we never understand what goes on the street, um, as, as, you know, as, as Tina was saying. Um, and Personally, I think that one of the blind spots for, for the UN is like the, the, the municipal, the, how to link peace and security and peace building support to more municipal level decision making on service delivery, law and order, um, governance um, in, more, in more, um, um, more general terms. And that seems to be the blind spot or the local level, you know, um, very subcontracting um, support that the UN does rarely does it link to the you know the, the local government or municipal level um, governance issues that's left out as oh if that's the UN agencies who come in and do or the you know or the, the whole the fiscal issues are for the World Bank and IMF to address. Um, you know I'm sort of repeating this silo mentality that I mentioned but I, I think that actually takes place across the, um, the, the, the you know the international system. Uh, so about that. Should I go, Christina? Yes, yes, please do, Peter. All right. Um, well, so the first thing I want to say is, is I, I, I really, it really resonates me, with me what Severine said and, and Sumi um, echoed, which is, I think there really is this thought consensus that lo the local is, uh, needs to be elevated in our approaches. So the number of times that I hear, even in government uh, policy circles, Local knowledge, local solutions, local peace building um, is 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 widespread. But I think where we continue to get stuck is this translation from talking about those things to actually putting them into practice and in how we do our operations and how we we operate differently. And so, you know, one of the things I really appreciate about the Peace Science Digest and the work that many of the organizations that are represented here are doing and putting forward is specific prag pragmatic examples of how for international actors we can operate differently to try to apply some of these principles. So that's the first. Second thing I want to say is um, I think it's important to keep in mind that when we say the turn to local peace building, that isn't to say that it's only local peace building. You know, I think we we have to keep in mind and I think you know the 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 second article in the digest which talks about the dynamic between local and national level peace building, is so important and, and one of the points it makes is that the interplay between local, national, regional, and international is so important to look at how are actors aligned or not aligned, what are the ways that, that they can reinforce one another. I think when, when we look at a lot of the conflicts, the, the armed conflict situations of substantial violence that we see today, a lot of it is driven by a uh, breakdown in the relationship between national level institutions, or in some cases, regional level institutions, and those communities that we're talking about, where, um, where we're trying to do, do some of this work and engage and, and achieve different, different kinds of, of partnerships. And so for international actors, as we're thinking about the peace building work that we can do, what I'm really interested in is how can we reinforce collaborative peace building relationships that cut across the local, the national, and the regional. And one of the things that, from an optimistic standpoint, that I think is really exciting is the number of governments around the world that are actually establishing and expanding specific institutions whose mandate is to work on peace building and engagement with local actors for this work. So I think about in, um, in Ghana, there's a National Peace Council. Ethiopia has established a peace ministry. Sudan, going through its historic transition, now has a peace commission. To me, some of these institutions can be really a, a fulcrum for bridging some of the regional, national, and local things that, that we want to accomplish. And so I think that as we, as we make this turn to local, I guess let's absolutely make it. Let's make it in practical terms. 
But let's not just talk about the local, because I think the solutions that we seek, the kinds of transformation that we seek, is going to require us to operate across these different levels. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, for me personally, the paraphrasing of the word local turn is peace building, I feel should be paraphrased into peace building is always local. It is always local. The local turn or twist or you know whatever comes based on how the business of peace have come about into this world. We, if we have to be genuine about peace building today now in 2020 with COVID, with rising authoritarian regimes, with more and more displaced people than ever before, we have to take this headlong. And let me put a few um, argument points towards this, why I am saying this. Again, these are thoughts which have come after listening to some of you here. Um, how local peace, uh, you know, uh, peace work is represented, it's the way in which the turn or, or the twist comes in the way in which many of the work which has been happening at the local ground has been actually appropriated and then presented as whatever solutions at the UN or other multilevel level. That is, that is the issue, you know. For example, in Manipur, where I come from, we have over 104 year old nonviolent women's peace movement, indigenous women's peace movement. But this, the, the world doesn't know about. And it is not in UN documents, it's not in you know, Indian textbooks. People don't know about it. But again, for us, this peace has always been local. You know, it's about our lives, it's about the way we want our lives to be normal and to be at peace. Uh, this is what we felt. The other thing is, again, let us look at this data. For every $1 of aid that the developed world gives to the developing world, they make us buy $10 worth of weapons. Peace building, local, national, international are all important. You got to involve the village headmen. <laughs> you got to involve the woman who has survived or who have been bereaved in the conflict. You got to involve the parliamentarians. You got to involve interrogators. You got to involve everyone involved in this. For me, I will not segregate saying we should take it and we have spoken. Uh, I have met Kofi Annan many times. Also, I have met several village headmen in my region, also women leaders, indigenous women leaders, known and unknown. We got to involve the youth groups, the stakeholders in this effort. So. But to be able to really do for me, I would paraphrase is to be able to really make peace building uh, you know, meaningful. We have to ask this question that if the permanent five members of the UN Security Council produces 88% of the world's weapons and many of the wars and conflicts are in the global South, we don't we have a time in 2020 now to think that this got to change we have over $1.4 trillion of money in weaponry. If 10% of this could be used, it could make the UN Sustainable Development Goal by 2030 possible. If 10% of the money spent in a military industrial complex is put in Sustainable Development Goal, the people can you know, eliminate poverty in the world by 2030. But no one is talking about it. So for us, some of us who have been born in war zones, for us, peace is not a project. It's a commitment for a lifetime. And so we're going to ask these tough questions that why the top-down approach is because who are creating these wars, who are supplying these weapons of war to all the parts of the world, which has resulted in this. So this is so, so much important. And fi my final point, even in local peace building, it's mostly led by patriarchal forces. <laughs> Patriarchy, which I think in your science digest, you've also used the term neo patriarchs or something like that. And that's so true. For example, in India's Northeast, we have 17 peace talks and not a single indigenous woman is in it. So it is also local peace building is about ensuring that women are just not making tea and bring it to when the men talk, but it's also ensuring that women are, are sitting there 
and signing the peace agreements. Only 13% women are in peace negotiations around the world. This has to change. So inclusion of women, ensuring that the world spends less on military and more on achieving sustainable development goals, which every country in the world has signed up to. So these are some of the steps I believe are absolutely needed to ensure that peace building, local, national, and international is made meaningful. Thank you, Bina. And you just perfectly anticipated my next point because as an anthropologist, one of my professional pet peeves is when any group of people is presented in a monolithic way. This can be anything from bureaucracy, but then also with this term, the local. And so what I wanted to ask you next, as we're speaking with someone who's led three organizations, how do you ensure that there is a diversity of local voices represented in these processes? Could you share with us from your experience some of the best practices here for including traditionally marginalized voices? This is such an important question, Christina. I come from an area where we have got 272 indigenous communities, 272, speaking 400 languages. Now, such a diverse part of the world. It is a national geographer's paradise. But this part of the world has so much resources. And again, as I said, so much of violence for the last 70 years. So for us, to, be, to do peace work, we had to ensure that our policies, because many of the peace agreements are only signed with the major warring group. <laughs> it's always with the one who, you know, has been the most, you know, what can I say, violent. This is why the peace building has failed till now. They've always spoken to the, those who are the most bullying kind, the bullies of the world, literally, <laughs> whether it's Manipur or here, I don't know, wherever. So the thing is, it's we got to change and invert that. And particularly, that's why I always say that, uh, and then especially when um, local journalists come and report also, they're only covering one side of the story too. So it is so important in today's world where there is about racial justice conflict going on and the attempt to get racial justice for people around the world is exactly happening in our region too. And we actually uh, you know, started a whole campaign on ensuring that India should have a national diversity policy, for example. And we asked India to have an anti-racial law. This came from our peace work. And you may be surprised to see how come racial justice and peace work, they're so much related. The reason is conflict has made a lot of thousands of people displaced and they come to Indian metropolitan cities. The word that the rest of India gives to indigenous people of Northeast is the word chinky, means people with small Chinese features. So during coronavirus times, we were asked to go back to China. People were spat at. People had to leave their rented apartments. So we faced racism at very close corners. So, and it was shocking for us when we realized that India, a country of 1.4 billion people, doesn't have a multi-racial uh, uh, you know, policy, multicultural policy like Canada does. So what we have done is that's in one way, there are so many challenges with the UN, Sumi is from there, but there are so many I love the documents which is produced at the UN, the knowledge production documents. You have to give it to some of the thinkers there. We took the UN documents and ensured that the UN Convention on Racial Discrimination, in which it talks about even uh, the fact that, you know, all, you know, you should not discriminate based on gender, race, region, religion. So in our peace work, we realized the importance of this because of having faced racism at the national level. So when we're acutely aware of the, the, uh, the presence of 39 ethnic groups, for example, in Manipur, or 272 across the Northeast of India. And in fact, in 2015, we had our first Northeast India Women Peace Congregation. And we ensured that women from all the warring groups came together for the first time in our history. And it was an amazing moment for us because we have been divided so many times uh, in many ways, because uh, you know, colonial divide and rule policy goes on. So there's so much of division in many of these conflict zones that if we fight with each other, the, the, the one which is, which is you know, main perpetrator walks away. So we united together and for, for that diversity was a very critical element, number one. Number two, just like you have said, one of the problems with uh, the world and with many movements is people are stuck to be a leader. And we have to give our chairs up. We cannot, we should have, we should create different lines of leadership, intergenerational, interethnic, intercommunity, inter, 
uh, you know, translate, we got to create that. So that's why uh, for us, it's really, really important. And the founding of the Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network for us was at the local level. That's at the Indo-Burma border where we work with more than 20,000 women who have been widowed in this conflict. And we set up the Control Arms Foundation of India in New Delhi, because that's where all the parliamentarians are. So for 15 years, we tried to let the government of India understand why they need to, to demilitarize the Northeast of India, why it would be a confidence building measure to get the martial law out of Northeast of India, because you cannot claim to be a world's largest democracy and teach yoga to the world when you have had 45 million people at gunpoint in my part of the world. So that's why we set up the Control Arms Foundation of India, which has got more people from Kashmir, people from uh, Mumbai, we had people from Tamil Nadu, it's a pan-India movement. So the local, the national, and also by because of the work that we have done, people recognize, and we, we reached the UN uh, almost a decade back at the UN uh, meeting on small arms and light weapons. That's where we were exposed to the international work, Sumi, actually. And I was, I really learned a lot from uh, friends from around the world. It's and when I realized that the conflict in Manipur is not we alone in this issue. When we met people from Rwanda, Afghanistan, Argentina, Guatemala, I felt we were a part of a global family. The modes of repression, the modes of militarization were the same. And the modes of then what we call local peace building became so much, literally, may I use the word, globalized in an indigenous peace way. <laughs> so this is how we manage uh, you know, to do to work all this while and um, yeah. Well, as much as I would like to, I know that I can't monopolize just with my questions to our panelists. And I know that we're going to be soon transitioning into answering questions from the audience. Um, I think I will just plant in, in our panelists' minds a few of the topics that I know you have much to say on. And perhaps as we transition, you could briefly comment on them or you could weave them into the uh, answers that I know you'll be giving soon. I know, Peter, you can tell us a lot about the Global Fragility Act and um, how this might weave into this, this local, locally-led peace-building emphasis that we've gathered here to talk about. Um, Sumi, I wanted to ask you about the fact that the UN is a really unique institution in terms of juggling different political emphases um, and how do you stand in the middle here and then and work to meaningfully bring people together despite very real constraints. And Severine, I had also wanted to ask you um, about questions about what surprised you in this research, because even when you've been doing this, as your biography says, 20 years, I anticipate that there were some surprises there. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite um, my colleague from War Prevention Initiative, Patrick, um, to begin to uh, tell us the questions that the audience has been asking. Uh, thank you, Christina. Um, so I have been monitoring questions and uh, want to start with some angles that were not extensively covered in these fascinating conversations. And then I'll merge a few of the questions and hopefully we'll give all of you the opportunity in answering those to tie together your major thoughts after more than an hour of really fascinating discussions. So I'm just going to jump into the first one um, that came up and read it to you. And then um, I think the way I look at it, that is one that everyone could address uh, from your uh, perspectives. So uh, often we see the US military being used in a capacity it was not designed for, local peace building. In the military, we recognize this tension as the result of our organization being large and well-resourced enough to take on the role that normally the State Department or USAID would assume in conflict zones. With that being said, where do you see the military's role in peace development and in creating the conditions for local leaders to create strong and sustainable community-led peace? What policy recommendations would you advise to best use uh, the US military in peace development? And if you want to go in the same order that you've uh, been before, if that works for you, um, please go ahead, uh, Severine. Okay, uh, then I'm going to be extremely brief. I don't really see a role for the military in, uh, in building peace. Uh, an army is uh, not, uh, I mean, soldiers are not trained to do peace building. 
uh, they're not set up to do peace building. Uh, they're not set up to do locally led peace building or international peace building for that matter. Uh, so I would defer to other speakers because for me, I think that the main role of the military would be to step back and let uh, other actors and uh, civilians uh, uh, and local peace builders take the lead. And maybe if uh, ordinary people, local civilians, local peace builders, ask for a very specific, narrowed, targeted, uh, punctual kind of help from the military, maybe in some circumstances, there might be a role for the military, but that, to me, that's opening the door to uh, a very risky, um, a very risky proposition. So, so I would say that the best role of the military would just be to step back. Maybe um, <clears throat> um, I can sort of decipher a little bit and sort of differentiate the military as in contingents and the military expertise, perhaps. Um, I have in mind, so I've been doing, looking at ceasefire monitoring quite a bit. And um, in places like the Nuba Mountains or Mindanao uh, in the Philippines and then and, and Aceh and elsewhere, uh, we have had, uh, the international community has had unarmed military observers uh, working with local national monitors to do very sort of location specific, um, you know, ceasefire viola monitoring ceasefire violations dispute resolution and so forth. This is a much smaller scaled uh, intervention to really engage commanders from you know, the, the government side or rebel side, um, very tactical level um, um, confidence building, communication mechanism. And I think you also have that example of Bougainville in your special issue. There have been those small scale um, interventions uh, with the military expertise that might actually um, serve specific purpose. But if you have in mind more again, militarized intervention like in Afghanistan and, and so forth, yes, I mean, I would share the same concern. So this is a great question. I could, we, I would love to have a separate uh, uh, panel in which we could, could talk about this. I, I wanted to share a few thoughts. The first is, in the time that I have worked in the US government, I have been struck by how some of my US military colleagues have been some of the greatest advocates uh, within our system for the need to be investing more in peace building and doing peace building efforts. I think many of the military folks that have worked in these types of conflict and, and fragile environments appreciate the fact that military solutions are not sustainable and they don't bring kind of the lasting security or stability that we seek. And so uh, I think the military often can be really important advocates for um, uh, what we're talking about here today. Second thing is that um, I, I do believe the military can provide some specific targeted support for peace building efforts, which I'll go into in just a second. But I think the military really needs the civilian actors to lead. And so I think what I want to say is that the US, within the US government, the challenge is really for the State Department and our US Agency for International Development to articulate a vision and an agenda and then allow the military to, to fit into that. I think what I see in a lot of environments, if you look over the last 20 years, is where the US military has been engaged in a vacuum of other leadership, they end up engaging in things that we might say look like and feel like peace building or peace building related activities because other in parts of our institutions are not stepping up to, to provide leadership in that regard. And Christina mentioned the Global Fragility Act, which if you're not already tracking it, is a very exciting piece of legislation that was passed by the US Congress and signed into law by the president at the end of last year. It calls on those of us in the administration to develop a long-term strategy for how the US government can better partner with actors around the world to try to help uh, break this cycle of fragility and conflict. And it puts front and center the kind of support we need to provide on issues like conflict prevention, stabilization, and, uh, and, and, the pe and peace building writ large. And I think one of the reasons it's so important is it can provide the kind of leadership so that the military actors can figure out how they are supportive of that agenda as opposed to having the flip dynamic, which is often the case. 
the, the last thing, just talking about the, the positive role that I think military actors can play, you know, we know that security forces are a key actor at the national level and at the local level in many of these situations of conflict and violence. And if we can't change the role, the behavior, and the incentive structure of those security forces, then we're never going to see the kind of change uh, that we want. And so the military has a lot of influence uh, in their engagement with partner forces in the places where they're operating. And so one of the things that I'm really interested in is how can we use that leverage, use that engagement that's taking place to try to influence security force behavior, to try to bring security forces on board with these peace processes. Um, I think, you know, oftentimes we overlook the leverage that we have in that regard. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, um, and, I, and I think uh, lots more to say on this, but I appreciate the question. Yeah, uh, for, for me, um, as Severin said, I'm with Severin in terms of, um, you know, Costa Rica, Costa Rica doesn't have an army at all, doesn't have a military. And the question which I've always discussed with Jody William from Nobel Women Initiative, if, if there's a Ministry of Defense, why not a Ministry of Peace in our countries? Think for a moment. Why should everything be militarized? I taught a course called Women, War, and Peace in Connecticut College, and I taught a chapter called Militarizing a Can of Soup. Our lives are so militarized that we do not understand through our films, our books, our cinemas, everything is so militarized. So militarization and peace cannot go together. Cannot go together. I would like to put this. On the other hand, what we, I would say is, some of you have also shared, it's important that they may be useful in certain areas. That's why the UN peacekeeping troops are there, right? So that they are coming from different countries, coming mostly from the global south, you know, operating in different parts of the world. For me, I would rather, I, uh, uh, you know, I talked with one of my colleagues at Control Arms Foundation of India, Ravinder Pal Singh, who earlier worked with Cipri, and he actually has coined a term called stability units. Let's not use the word military because it doesn't work. Military means violence. It means violent. It is a person with gun. It's, it's a very toxic masculinity, you know, kind of ultra, you know, nationalism kind of thing, which we, the women peace activists, are tired of. We, we got to invert that again. So rather than you are, uh, you know, using military, what I would say if nations around the world or community need some certain kind of uh, care in terms of uh, to protect communities, and if it cannot be done by local peace builders, uh, nations should create what is called stability units. Who doesn't don a military fatigue and wield, uh, you know, uh, whatever weapon and go into a village? There should be a different way of thinking towards ensuring peace in our communities without the military. The military can guard nation states. It's a part of the UN Charter. I'm not utopic to say you abolish a military, but if Costa Rica can do it, I think it's, it's time for countries also to rethink. So military and peacekeeping must be, uh, they are not in the same boat. Uh, thank you all. And um, this is really a nuanced conversation on highly complex topic. And I appreciate how you all really dig into that. And for us to keep it at that level, um, I don't want to just throw all the questions at you and get sound bits, but I want to try to merge some of the major ones and tease out those pathways forward a little bit more that you already discussed in your conversations. So perhaps uh, after I uh, connect those last questions, all four of you can tie together the essence of what you really wanted us to take away from here today in answering those questions. So um, how much and often are the perception of locals taken into consideration in every step of the peace building process within a specific community? And how does that affect the overall trajectory of a peace building approach? So what is the vision there of merging bottom up with top down approaches? Or what can be done if someone with a PhD and years of experience in peace building um, how can he, he or she, you know, defer leadership to local people, the local culture, the situation? Um, also, a question about 
how might the local turn that we talked about fundamentally reshape some of the bedrock assumptions of international peace builders about their own role. And uh, this was really interesting, I'm going to read it. During COVID, I have heard colleagues who are aid workers or peace builders express how they feel that they've lost their identity because they can't jet off to the next location. This is a challenge when it is built into the identity and our understanding of our purpose. So hopefully with those questions, you can kind of tie it together. And with that, I'm going to be quiet again and uh, turn it over to you and then to Christina. Severine, did you want to, we always put you on the spot, but did you want to take first stab at that or? These are rich questions. Okay, um, these are very, very rich questions and, and each question would deserve an entire webinar. Um, so answering in two minutes or, or one minute would be hard, uh, especially answering three very different questions all together. Let me think. The, the one thing, okay. Okay, the, the one thing that uh, that would be the thread connecting these questions is that yes, there are a lot a lot of challenges when when we're talking about how can a PhD educated person who thinks that he or she knows everything because he or she has done a PhD in the best university in the world and spent five years studying something, how can she uh, get the humility to uh, defer to uh, to, to people on the ground. Uh, how can uh, this uh, so-called local turn actually reshape the assumptions rather than just being something at the level of the discourse? And, and, and how can interveners, uh, uh, international peace builders, uh, get, uh, say goodbye to their usual way of life and all of the perks of uh, working in international peace building and being able to jet off and, and to attend all of the nice parties that uh, Sumi was telling us about. Uh, to me, the thing is that we have to realize that the current peace building system is not working. It's not only not working, but we're making things worse. Uh, very often uh, on an everyday basis all over the world, not only in the 35 conflict zones that Peter was mentioning, but also in the 300 plus co unofficial conflict zones that uh, Bina was mentioning. So it's not working at all. And the thing is that most of the people I know who work in peace building are people who really care about their work. Uh, and they really care about uh, ending violence on the ground. And so if we acknowledge that our current system doesn't work, then it's a first step. And the next step is to look at what actually works. And there are many, 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 many um, local peace building efforts that work uh, that I in, in my new book, I talk a lot about the island of Ichwi in Congo, where people have managed to build peace in, in the most like unlikely circumstances. They are in the middle of a, of a of an enormous conflict with millions of deaths, with tons of rebel groups, foreign rebel groups, local rebel groups, etc. And uh, they have everything in on the island that has led to violence in other parts of Congo, and yet they've managed to build peace. And they've done that by uh, deferring to, to ordinary citizens, to local leaders, by having ordinary citizens, everybody step up to maintain the peace. Uh, and by creating what they call a culture of peace uh, on their island. Uh, and also by, by, by building on, on very strong beliefs that make peace more sustainable, uh, like magic and accusations of sorcery. And uh, so it's, it's a fascinating case. And, and there are many others around the world. I've, I've, I've written an almost an entire chapter on Somaliland, because again, Somaliland is absolutely fascinating. It's the best case of bottom-up peace building that I've found in any parts of the world, uh, where you, when you compare with the situation going on in Somalia, where Somalia is incredibly violent uh, and, and, and the situation is, is horrible in, in many different dimensions and economically and, and security, etc. But people in Somaliland, in, in the autonomous region, in the northeastern part of Somalia, they've managed to build peace. They've even managed to build a state and to build democracy 
again, relying on local leaders, relying on local cultures, on uh, clan structures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So what I'm saying here is that, yes, there are many challenges, and we all know about the challenges, and academics have written extensively about challenges, and I've written extensively about challenges, and, and, and Sumi, and Peter, and Bina, and we, we've talked about these challenges, but the way forward is to look at what works, and how, uh, not only, you know, what works in terms of local peace building on the ground, but also the international organizations and, and the foreign individuals who have managed to find a way to be low profile, uh, to be uh, to work in actual partnership with local organizations and with local people. And I found people like that in all kinds of organizations. There are uh, Sumi's colleagues, uh, some of them are fantastic and do fantastic work. I found people like that in the State Department. I found people like that in non-governmental organizations like, like Peace Direct. I have an entire case study, a chapter on the Life and Peace Institute. And these people who can teach us how we can do. Uh, and, and really, we can we have role models to follow in terms of organizations and in terms of individuals who work in any kind, who have the same kind of background that we have educational or national or organizational or professional backgrounds. And we can actually model our action on their behavior so that next time that we try to promote local peace building, we can actually do that. And we can we can model our behavior not only to build peace in faraway places, uh, uh, in you know, outside of the United States or outside of wherever you're all based, but also, Christina, I think at the beginning you were mentioning how we have also to look inward, uh, and especially like I, I talked to you here from New York, where uh, we're very worried about what's going to happen with the election and, and after the elections, and about the risk of of, of low level or, or even more than low level violence. And there are a lot that we can learn from conflict zones and from local peace builders and, and foreign peace builders in how to actually build peace around us and, and maintain uh, the level of, of peace and, and, and the quality of life that we all have. Can I, can I jump in just, uh, I think for me, there are just, uh, I see five basic steps in front of us to be able to achieve how do we look at synergies towards that. First, to recognize that uh, peace, peace making, peace building today is very unequal. In fact, I call it, there is a caste system in peace building that, that needs to be looked upon and, and addressed uh, to be able to make peace meaningful locally, nationally, and internationally at all levels. Second thing, uh, with my colleagues at Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, we have a hashtag called follow the money. Again, how do we then invest 1.4 trillion into 10% of that into SDGs, Sustainable Development Goal, into issues which can ensure proper health facilities, ensure education, right to life. We got to demilitarize our way of thinking. That's really important. Um, again, as I mentioned, I repeat, 2% of all international aid which goes to the developing world reaches communities. We got to invert that. We got to ensure that when you plan projects, that 98% is not going in just this suprastructure. We ensure that the communities get 50% of whatever you're investing, and particularly to donors, this is my appeal. You must have a more proactive approach that you have to get more you know, local people who are working in this because resource is very scarce, and we've got to ensure that it's done meaningfully, which one of your report. The third is please give agency to people who are from different parts of the world who are at the front line of peace work. Give them a voice, get them to speak, get them to, to intervene at the UN, get them to speak them and, and do not do one person all the time. Uh, one Greta Thunberg cannot do climate change in the world. You got to have a thousands of them and including people of all communities, caste, color, creed. We have to ensure that it is a more diverse way of peace building. Number four, okay. People who do PhD, I really respect, but also it's really important that again, a lot of these uh, thinkers have a very top-down approach of having 300 case studies and making their smart assessment. And this is important too, this larger approach, but please involve uh, uh, you know, local peace builders as you do your research writing analysis. And we are very happy to help you in this. And my final point, um, COVID has shown us that we couldn't even afford a mask, a ventilator. Millions have like, been affected around the world have, and hundreds of thousands have died. 
this shows that with all the militarization and the weaponization and the nationalism in the world, we cannot even protect the lives of our loved ones. This shows that actually the neoliberal policies are failing and we got to recognize that. And that's where my final point comes. As a person who has born up, born, you know, living close to nature, where money and exchange economy, just like Marxism or Adam Smith have propounded, we did not live that kind of life. It's so important that we get the idea of indigenous peacemaking and particularly indigenous women and their ways of peacemaking and of how they have done connected with environment, connected with sustainable development. We must give them now the agency to share their traditional knowledge because that will help in actually healing and bringing peace to the world. Thank you. So uh, Peter, do you wanna address those simple questions? Yeah, no, I'm gonna punt on most of them. I, I wanna first just say, cause I know we're getting close to time, just how much I've appreciated the chance to be with this, uh, these inspiring uh, fellow panelists. I've, I've been writing far more notes than I expected to. Um, so uh, I really enjoyed that. Two things that I wanna leave us with from, from my standpoint. First is, you know, we talked about how we're changing the way we talk about these issues. I think the, the next step is to really change the mindset of our organizations. And I'm speaking from, a, of course, a government, international organization uh, standpoint. We, we, you know, we, we, we talked today about the need to think politically, to be more humble, to be, you know, cultivating inclusive local voices. That's got to be ingrained into the culture of how we do business and how we think about our work. And I think we've we've got a, a lot of work to do uh, in that regard, but 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 there's momentum. Second and and, and bigger point I want I want to emphasize is this work that we're talking about, and, and and all of you know this, and many of the people we have uh, that are part of the session, this is really hard work. It's not stuff that is done overnight. It involves people's lives, people's livelihoods, people's families, people's communities, and I think we have to therefore both be realistic, and that means changing the way we think about time horizons, the way we think about you know, what we expect for quote unquote results um, uh, based on that. And we've also just got to dig into some of this, the, the not very glamorous uh, uh, practical issues like how, um, you know, how do we, where do, are we spending the money? I mean, Bina, I love your hashtag follow the money. I'm not sure you know, we might use it the same way, but um, but I agree with you. I mean, where is the money going? Let's let's understand that. Let's dig into that. You know, from a from a, a U.S. government standpoint, where do we do we have the right staff? Do they have the right training? Are we creating access for them to be able to go out and engage directly with the communities that they are uh, trying to 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 um, to respond to or to to interact with? Um, the, these issues are are, are hard. Um, but I'm, I'm really heartened by our, our collective commitment and this great special issue and uh, look forward to more discussions in the months ahead. And uh, Sumi, please. Yeah, I think I'm actually will go even further. Um, and I'll also um, answering um, Christina's question about um, how the international peace builders could contend with the national policies or politics while engaging in local communities. To be blunt, I don't think the UN peace builder is content with national politics um, at all, um, beyond the technical assistance the, to the formal institutional processes like the constitutional reform and the elections and so forth, um, to avoid being political. Right? Um, of course, I'm overgeneralizing it, but I mean, I mean, the fact that the UN doesn't really get involved in the security sector reform really showcases how cautious and issues and also you know again uh, the, the 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 peace building equation with state building really puts the UN firmly behind the, the governments right um or the whoever happens to be in the government at the time of the uh, the, the conflict the conflict solution and that makes us partial but we don't even raise that kind of question I mean the assumption is always that UN intervention is a good thing but we don't really question whether or not we actually taking one side or not. But you know, um, in the, by 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 way, by way of how we do business. So I've been thinking about this, and I'm going to even betray my own department. 
I even wonder whether we even need a UN mission, um, you know, uh, the, whether it's peacekeeping mission or special protocol mission. Um, when Bina was speaking, um, I was thinking like, can we sort of, again redefine our own role? Can we only focus on data collection analysis for the normative conversation, like right, the human rights and so forth, and really focus on convening power and not do missions like the way we do. I mean, the majority of peacekeeping budget go to the troop and police contributing countries deploying troops to conflict areas. You know, that has nothing to do with the local conditions or local peace building for that matter. Um, and, and it probably, um, you know, um, that especially at this time of the financial climate, that large missions are on decline in any way. I think we could, again, um, ask the kinds of questions like oh, the, the new architecture that we need to envision. We always take it for granted that there is a three layer of international peace with an architecture studies in the UN and in the national and local, but can we actually skip some of the layers? Can we think about the, the new era where, you know, the UN is only the place for people to come together, as Bina was saying, rather than, you know, being the technical, um, you know, assistance provider, which other people can do for peace Um, And, you know, <laughs> then please don't quote me, because <laughs> I might lose my job. But um, that would be sort of my, my sort of ongoing thoughts these days. Thank you. Well, I can't thank each of you enough for, for not only coming with your time, but also coming with, I think, the best of your thinking. We've really dug into the hard issues. And I know that um, the special issue, as well as organizations like War Prevention Initiative, Peace Direct, and the Better Evidence Project, really feel it's so important to our mission to keep these conversations going. Um, with that said, I'd like to give the last word to my colleague, Bridget, representing Peace Direct today. Thank you so much, everyone. I have the very easy job of simply saying thank you as we've come to the end of a, an amazingly rich conversation about a topic that is dear to Peace Direct's heart. As you know, Peace Direct was founded over 15 years ago with a solar, a sole focus mission on supporting locally led peace building. And at that time, not too many people were talking about it. And so to have this remarkable conversation, not just about how to talk about it, but to really push all of us towards how do we move from rhetoric to reality and to real change to support uh, local peace, locally led peace building and really making peace stick. Um, so thank you so much for an incredibly rich conversation. I know we're gonna wanna uh, follow up with um, all of you on a number of the topics that have been brought up. And I wanna thank you for your honesty and for your commitment, each of you, each of these speakers in their own context is pushing, I know, um, in really important ways to move this agenda forward. And I just want to really appreciate the work that you all do. And thanks so much to our wonderful guests um, who've joined us on a Friday afternoon for this conversation. We really appreciate your questions, your participation, um, and look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you all so much. <laughs>